Hi, and welcome to the March 2018 Mobile Caddy product update. Um, just quick introductions. Uh, myself, Justin, CEO of Mobile Caddy. I'm joined by Paul, our CTO, uh, Todd, our mobile chief technical architect, and Frank, our lead product engineer. Uh, as always, we've picked out a number of updates um, from our last product update. Um, the last product update was actually a month and so ago, and we had our spring 18 release and pre-release testing. So as is normal, we have a big heads down time as we do all those uh, uh, early tests and make sure we're all prepared for any changes or any excitement that the Salesforce release may bring to us, our partners and customers. Um, so good to be back on track with the updates. So uh, yeah, let's get started. Um, so first of all, probably aligned around the uh, Salesforce releases, as everyone may know, uh, every Salesforce release, the spring, summer and winter are actually aligned to a Salesforce API uplift. Um, and Paul, this is something that we have a quite a strict policy around in terms of availability and, and testing. So I wondered if we could start with um, that as it's quite uh, uh, attached to the, the, the spring that we've just gone through, the spring release, the Salesforce release. Uh, yes, thank you, Justin. Yes, yeah, so we've actually seen um, in, in this release coming through a, uh, a couple of new um, objects that we've um, decided to support. We, uh, As people know, we've gradually pushed out each release a set of, of objects. And um, uh, and in, in line with that, we also have to check our um, API upgrade. And as you've alluded to there, we, we, we up our API and we, we attempt to keep it just behind um, sales forces each time the API comes out each sales force release so in terms of what's what's recently happened the the, the more exciting news here is uh, we've got a couple of new objects um, that came through and and this this update ties closely to the API that I've just mentioned so the two new objects that we've pushed through recently are the um, the contacts to multiple accounts functionality in Salesforce has, has produced an object called uh, account contact relation um, what, what you can actually do now, your sales reps in Salesforce can track relationships between the customers and businesses, and you can have contacts now to multiple accounts. So customers can set that up in the org and they get this lovely new object that unfortunately until now we, we didn't support. So popular demand, and uh, we've pushed that through, Justin. Um, and in addition, there's a, a, another object, um, which, which is all to do with the field service uh, work that Salesforce supports, another standard object called location, and that kind of represents, I don't know, it could be a warehouse or a, a work site, a service vehicle, and so on. So that object has also come through, and it, it came through with a little challenge. Um, it, uh, it required, um, what we discovered was when we went to support this object, it only appeared higher up in the latest version of the Salesforce API. So. What we've had to do unusually, rather than keeping just one behind, um, is, is push ourselves right up to the latest and do an extreme amount of testing. But those two objects are now available, and our mobile caddy package now supports the, the latest API, which is version 42. So if you get the latest mobile caddy package um, and upgrade your latest dynamic version, you'll, you'll find you'll be able to uh, mobilize both of those uh, objects. Brilliant, Paul. Yeah, and it's worth noting, isn't it? Um, the reason for that uh, lag, if you like, on the API is is we let the Salesforce release settle down itself. We've all seen sort of critical updates, and we also monitor, and we'll talk about this a bit later, the actual patch releases for Salesforce as well. So we let those settle down, uh, as as we don't want to be introducing any any issues um, for us. But Paul, just before we go on to the next item, it's it's worth noting here that that API. Um, is the customer's choice in the sense that the mobile caddy components, um, are, new components are released. Um, so, so, so in terms of running applications, so I've got an application today that I built last year. Um, I've got a lot of protection here, haven't I? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. So when, 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 when I talk about the API upgrade, I should have uh, gone into a little bit more detail on that. As if, if, let's take, for example, um, one of our uh, versionable classes, uh, probably the most commonly spoken about one is the sync refresh class, the, class, the code that actually pulls data up and down from your device. When we upgrade that, even if we just upgrade the API um, version stamped against it, we will not touch that class or its version. We will clone that class. We have a new version of the class 
and you're you're, you're quite right, Justin. Uh, uh, you know, if you upgrade Mobile Caddy itself, you will not your running system will not touch that new class unless you sp explicitly go through the process. So you go through your probably your dev dev environment or your, your your sandbox environment. You'll upgrade your dynamic version to use the latest component, and you'll go through the life cycle integration testing and through into production. So. Yes, yeah, sorry, I should have mentioned that. No fears, no, 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 no need to, to be scared. It's all very, very robust and taken care of. No, I, I love it. I, th I think I always reiterate this as we go through because it's one of those things, isn't it, in a package upgrade that people do get concerned that, um, you know, they're, they're going to have some uh, more impact. And this really is just that absolute idea of we don't just have partition versions to protect, but we have partition components really just always in the pursuit of stability and performance. Um, the other thing that um, came out of that, Paul, uh, which I'd like to raise with you is around one of the, I think people do find this one of the one of the benefits, particularly very early on in QA and UAT, but then using in production is this uh, ability to easily permission uh, an application to a, a set of users. And I think there was some both work around that and, and some uh, amendments uh, to the, um, the, the permissioning in general, if we could talk on that. Sure, absolutely, Justin. So yes, that's, that's actually a very, very good point. You imagine, imagine taking one of these. It could be any object, but we're, we're talking about these particular. Maybe, maybe we you mobilise the location object. Um, it comes across, um, you know, to the. You've got that in your your next environment up to test. Um, the, the object's created. You've got a, a maybe you're testing with a standard user. And um, what what actually um, you don't have to go through that pain of assigning uh, the permissions for that object and all of the relevant fields for that object to those profiles etc we've got a, a a tool there that produces um, a permission set based on the contents of the dynamic version so um uh, you know, so the click of a button really <laughs> and, it, and it shares the code a lot of this code is shared people might have seen the uh, the, the actual metadata checker which which you actually use prior to pushing the code across to make sure that everything that you've you've defined in your dynamic version is correct um, it, it, it so it's the same sort of code base that parses through that dynamic version and um, yeah we, we had a few we've had a few interesting ones recently the um, there was a bugget in there Justin um, where if, if, if customers were using the the task or the event object under the bonnet that are a little bit different they're, they're, they come under activities. So you've got the, the, the kind of the concept of activities and two objects, and they weren't coming through into the permission set correctly. Now that has all been taken care of. So as well as the permission set now correctly supporting version 42, and hence these new objects, we've also squashed a few bug apps in there. That, that's great. And I'm, I'm slightly off uh, the questioning, but uh, in the same vein, um, is, is this um, last latest release, Paul, something around the API permission as well um, from a community side? That may be something that's coming up up in front. I may be in front of you, but uh, w w w am I right? That's that's something that you've included as well. Um, not, not, not. It's it's not in the latest release, just to know. I think that's 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 close up on 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 the roadmap, though. So maybe maybe next month, Sam. Um, product update we'll be able to, to to cover that in a little bit of detail yeah fantastic in that there are some um as, as we we'll allude to a bit later there is a, a new tracker for known issues which were before quite difficult to see so some of these issues are very particular to user types so as we come on later i'll use that as an example um around how you know you can see some of the behavior particularly through the salesforce release changes and the critical updates um, but yeah, a, a massive amount of work both on the API and the permission updates. And as, as Paul alluded to there, uh, our policy is normally one behind. We are officially one behind as we start testing summer. And as we'll see probably on the next update, uh, we'll be talking about summer as we gain access into what's called uh, the early release uh, partner environments. Um, yeah, so lots of hidden work there, Paul, uh, neatly summarised, but uh, sounds fantastic. Um, so switching gears now, um, again, thinking about the environment that we work in. So we've been talking about a moving piece there, which is the Salesforce API. Um, Frank, can I pass to you to talk about um, particularly the app containers and the items we track and, and, and some of the items that we have to update for this month? Certainly, yeah. Uh, hello. So, um, yeah, as part of Mobile Caddy's um, trust and monitoring service that we do, um, store policies is one of these items that we uh, continually monitor. 
Um, so a store policy is something that's enforced by either the Apple App Store um, or the Google Play Store. And these can be uh, little things like you've got to support um, certain resolutions or devices or APIs. Um, and one of them that they brought out in April, the one that uh, we've been monitoring and tracking now, is support for iPhone 10. So this is love, uh, Apple's lovely new iPhone with the big screen. Um, and they're now requiring that all new builds, um, so this is either brand new apps to be deployed into the App Store or updates to existing apps, um, they should support um, iPhone 10 screen. So that means that uh, if you don't have that support, you'd get black bars at the top and the bottom um, of your app when it's running. Uh, looks like they're trying to get rid of all those apps. Um, so they're pushing out this new store policy to uh, bring all those new apps into line. Um, so we've added this support uh, for iPhone 10. Um, you don't need to do anything to existing apps. So if you've already got a mobile caddy app running on the store, um, this policy doesn't affect you. It only affects you if you're either um, releasing a new container app um, or if you have an update for an existing container app. Um, and on that point, if you do have an update going through or a new, a new app that you're pushing out, um, the only change there is to the splash screen resolution. So iPhone 10 support really comes down to the splash screen. As long as that's in place, then the whole app will support um, iPhone 10. So that means you need a splash screen of at least 2,800 um, by 2,800 pixels. Um, and we usually request this. So uh, unless you haven't given us that resolution splash screen, then um, that will just need to be updated. Otherwise, there's nothing nothing for you to do really, it's all handled by our build system, which is nice. Um, and the second piece in this store policy, so it's a sort of a two-parter from Apple here, um, is they're, they're bumping the requirements in the API used uh, to deploy to the App Store. Um, so again, like the iPhone 10 support, this is only for new or updates to existing apps on the App Store, this doesn't affect uh, current apps. Um, but this new uh, API, update um, requirement means that we'll be bumping our minimum iOS version support to iOS 10. Um, and again, just to reiterate, that doesn't affect any current running apps. They'll still continue to work on lower iOSs, but any new or updates to existing apps uh, will bring this new iOS 10 enforcement minimum into place. Brilliant. Yeah, really concise. Thanks, Frank. That's that's great. And um, again, we're sort of alluding to some of the tracking items um, and uh, uh, we'll, we'll have a little chat about uh, where, where you can find those uh, and the output of those um, on our trust site as we head toward the end of the call. But um, yeah, as always, you know, head of the game. Um, and I think Apple only gave everyone a very short amount of time for that policy. Um, so what's interesting, I think, across this is that, you know, uh, when we think about the performance of the applications and the lifetime, a lot of the time we'd be thinking of code. We'd be thinking of, you know, changing um, Salesforce features, releases and so on. But actually, the environment we operate in is much wider and sometimes something as innocuous as a policy uh, provided by Apple can actually have these implications. So, um, yeah, really quite happy of how much we track and, and bring this forward before uh, the release dates. Um, so, yeah, probably a, a, a larger uh, a switch in terms of what we're discussing then is really around uh, the core of, of mobile caddy which is this idea of offline first this ability to use our business critical apps in the field um, whether we have connection drop connection you know whether the um, the connection is available or not for long periods of time um, and that could be literally just dropping a connection for a few seconds we do not want to lose uh, data and we want to maintain the usability for the individual user as they're doing uh, most likely some critical process and recording some critical data all of this it really um, is as a hub is around our sync engine uh, and, and the sync performance um, and Paul this is a long uh, it's not worth saying this is a new thing it's a, it's a long running um, piece of work that we have always looking at um, both the performance and, and how the sync operates uh, that, that type of thing but um, the last couple of months again we've head down um, there's been a significant amount of work done in that sync engine Paul I wondered if we could service that and have a talk through Sure, yeah, I'd love to, Justin. Um, I'll, I'll talk a little bit and then maybe go on to Todd, who, to be fair, has done most of the work uh, in, in this area, to his credit. Um, but yeah, you're absolutely right when you were talking about that. It reminded me of uh, it's almost like day one. So when, when you, you know, 
the very early beta versions of mobile caddy had yeah you know, we found that you could it was absolutely uh, impossible to to, to write a, a fully robust functional um but offline app that just um asks for data and assumes it's going to get it or sends data up to the platform and assumes it's just got up there i mean what happens if it if, if you dropped connection or what happens if it wasn't received and so on and so forth um, you can't have uh, lost data or, or even duplicate data with apps trying and retrying and making guesses as to whether the other end has kind of got the data. So we, we introduced this concept of like a, a, a handshake um, around the call so that um, you, you know the, the, the data would be sent up or, or brought down and then mobile caddy would then go through this um, painstaking, detailed but very efficient process of checking to make sure that the data got to where it was supposed to get and if it didn't it would retry and and the customer wouldn't notice and, and that was the concept of uh, connection sessions which is our, our handshake and people many customers would have seen these connection sessions and they give a lot of analytical detail as to, to, to what's going on there justin um and so what we've done recently um i'll stop waffling on about the history and um, what we've done recently is that uh, we've endeavored to improve um, the performance by cutting down the amount of traffic backwards and forwards. So these handshakes that, that used to be separate calls um, are now included um, in the header, if you like, of the um, of the, the real data calls. Um, maybe I'd uh, maybe I'll um, keep quiet at this point and, and maybe let um, Todd elaborate further. If that's all right, Justin, on the, the detail of that. Yeah, Todd, if you can, that'd be really nice. So this is, um, uh, we, we'll talk about the changes that, that need to be uh, uh, pulled in, if, if any, for uh, clients and partners on their apps. But um, Todd, as, as, as Paul was saying, you know, this is about the compression of the number of calls and the traffic. Um, yeah, from your perspective, um, you know, how, how do you see that? Or how would we best describe that uh, for people to understand, uh, you know, what the, what the benefits are there? Sure. Uh, yes. So as, as Paul said, we have this the, the, the handshaking mechanism that, that's all about making sure that um, both the device and the platform um, know the real state of, e of each other um, and also of any kind of transactions that are occurring between them. And um, this is kind of it's not a trivial piece um, of the code. But what we've we've done is uh, be able to combine that really in the processing of those um, in, a, in a performant manner into um, the transactions are actually pushing and pulling data to and from the platform. Um, we have seen uh, some sync times. So in some scenarios, um, you could be getting up to a kind of 50% reduction in, um, in time. And this is through uh, mostly through reduction of HTTP calls. So the actual transactions between the device and the platform. Um, as Paul mentioned there was uh, there was work on the platform indeed uh, for this, but of course in the mobile caddy developer libraries as well. Um, and so updates on, on both sides really affect that sync engine to make sure that, that they're, they're all in, in sync. Um, and I think what you're alluding to there is you, you kind of, you won't be getting this out of the box. We'll, we'll, um, this will be rolled out through the kind of controlled um, controlled manner through our versioning system. I don't know if you wanted to, to, to talk on that um, on that point now. Yeah, I think that's that's right. So with with any of these, there's uh, dependencies and compatibilities between various components, both mobile caddy components and external. Some cases. Um, so yeah, I mean, you know, the the sync performance is is fantastic. I think to Paul's point is the key is that the robustness and the resilience is still there. So we always have robustness and resilience first, and then we're looking for efficiency second. And they work hand in hand as we increase robustness. We may um, you know, take a knock on efficiency, and then we look to uh, bring that back in line, or in this case, you know, significantly increase the efficiencies. The other thing about efficiency that's worth noting is that efficiency also uh, helps us in performance. The less calls we make, of course, the less calls that could be dropped, the less calls that the handshake may only have one side to that we have to pick up. So actually, some Sometimes, in this case particularly, increasing the efficiency, decreasing the calls, uh, compressing what's the, the that we're sending up and down, actually has also a benefit uh, to, to performance. Um, and as Todd was saying there, the key, and we talked a bit about this in the API uplift, is that Mobile Caddy is all about versioning and protection of running applications. So we want the benefit of taking the new features 
but we do not want to um, harm or potentially harm any running applications that may be chugging away quite happily for a year or so or longer. Um, and so in this case, the uh, sync upgrade pool is, is um, what's the sync class and above is uh, what, what, what number would we be moving to if, um, you know, let's say I'm on sync four or something, or where would I be targeting uh, in terms of sync class? Uh, you'd move up to the, the, the late, uh, right, right now you'd be looking up at uh, sync, sync seven. Sync. Um, I, I say that hesitantly because I know we're rapidly going to be pushing out uh, uh, sync eight and sync nine. Um, so it, it depends um, when when customers install the application. But um, yeah, sync sync seven and onwards, Justin would be uh, would be the best at the moment. Fantastic. Yeah. So in that perspective, we would have our running application and we might want to take advantage of this or we're building a new application. Um, and what we can do is we can choose the sync class uh, and its dependencies and the dependencies all handled automatically for us uh, from the platform perspective. And then we would also have a bump up and we'll talk about the bump up to the MC resource. That's our local libraries, my Buckley libraries running there and so by moving both of those pieces up creating a new version um, you can upgrade your application to take advantage of this and I'll talk with Todd in a second about the changes but but Paul from a platform perspective actually uh, other than uh, uh, clicking the button and creating the, the the new DV and selecting that sync I don't have to do anything do I um, in terms of platform configuration to take advantage of this absolutely right uh, the platform configuration um, is, is don't have to do anything else and in fact I I snigger a little bit because the the, the code that I had to change on, on, on in, in the platform side that my, myself and the guys here did was was minor it was Todd and his team who put most of the heavy lifting on this so uh, thanks and well done to them yeah really good and we're seeing that high performance so let's talk about the the uh, the, the library side then in terms of um, what we call the MC resource um, so here we would need to uplift that to a version, which we'll talk about in a second, which would then interact with the platform. But, but Todd, uh, we're, we're also backward compatible as well, aren't we? That's another big point before we go on to the version type. So even though you've done this work, uh, I don't have to consume it if, if I don't need either side, either platform uh, or um, library side. That's right. Yes. Um, so you could... Um... You could, let's say, for example, there was a, a feature that was that was um, coming out in the platform side, uh, and, and you upgraded your package. That doesn't necessarily mean that you need to um, be consuming any of these other features. Um, so the backwards compatibility, compatibility, sorry, um, in this um, this performance increase piece um, is, yeah, is, is is completely there. So you can be running um, an older version of the package with the newer library or the newer library with the with the older package, um, obviously we like um, we like people to, to to try and keep up to date as as possible because you get you get all the benefits um, in that instance. But yeah, there isn't any tie in to um, either or in in this particular release at least. Uh, brilliant. Yes, and there's a there's a long running piece uh, which we call our dependency and compatibility management system, um, which we won't go into now. But uh, if there was a reason that the two were tied, uh, that would be enforced um, uh, through the upgrade process. So, Todd, we, we we need to target then to to gain these extra features. We need to configure the platform as Paul's uh, talked us through, uh, and then we want to upgrade our MC resource. And as well as having the uh, CS in head, you've got another uh, feature that you wanted to mention. That's right. Yes, and there was there was one more kind of fits into this um, into this kind of uh, scheme of things. Really, um, we have a new flag available. So this is in the developer libraries and um, the sync mobile table call that's available in the API. Uh, we have a new argument that 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 function will take now that um, is called skip P to M, or it stands for uh, skip skip refresh, and um, to kind of yeah, I'm on our continuing the quest to optimize all the flows and. Um, and make apps more efficient. Um, what this flag will do if it's supplied into the, the sync mobile table call um, is it will suppress the request um, part that actually decides to, to pull down any new deltas or, um, or any new records from the platform down to the device. Um, this is useful in um, a handful of scenarios. They kind of, I should mention that it should be used um, with some, some proper thought in, in mind. Um, because you, you obviously don't want to be making calls and not pulling down data um, in, in your normal scenarios. Um, but there are some cases that you, you would want to do this. Uh, perhaps your, your, your flow um, 
you may um, you may have kind of records that aren't, aren't often updated on the platform that you're not interested in for a particular um, process point, sync point. Um, and another example, I think, is these these self-referencing objects um, where um, you may need to do um, kind of multiple syncs of, of the table to get um, to get everything up. Obviously, if they're, they're offline created, um, they need to be matched up when they get to the platform. Um, and if they're self-referencing, um, you potentially could see some failures on the initial call. And so you'd want to resync that table again, but you wouldn't be interested in pulling down any new records because they would have come down in the previous call. Um, so yeah, it's a, it's a straightforward Boolean flag that we have in here. Um, like I said, it's it's very, very useful, um, but it's kind of targeted to a few specific use cases. Um, so hopefully some, some people will, will get some value from this. Yeah, de definitely. Yeah, before we would have uh, had to do t two two calls, uh, particularly on the self-referencing, uh, and do two retrievals. And here we're again thinking about efficiency, which is why it's nice to talk in conjunction with the overall sync performance that uh, both Paul and Todd were talking about there. So yeah, I, I think this is great, um, and this sort of wraps uh, us up in terms of the um, the, the product updates. Um, we do want to just uh, mention a couple of documentation items. Um, Frank, I understand we've got uh, a, a new document available. Um, uh, from, from the app container perspective. That's right. It's, just, uh, it's a small update to um, an existing document. Uh, so we have a, um, a doc on the dev site that tells you how to update the endpoints for Windows 10 container apps. Um, so that's useful if you want to use a My Domain or a Sandbox. Um, the current instructions uh, list how to do that via the command line, um, but now we've added um, some new instructions for if you wanted to do that via the application shortcut so that's the one that can live on your desktop on windows and um, it's a bit nicer it means you don't have to dive into the command line and tap in some uh, commands you can just do it through a ui um, so yeah that's that's that one lovely thanks frank yes and um as usual that will be available on developer.mobilecaddy.net um but uh, just around this uh, call off there is a, a sort of a non-product update if you like but something that's very adjacent which we just wanted to mention something that the uh, the whole team here at mobile caddy have been working on for a number of months um and as well our product grows and particularly as the salesforce platform grows um there are lots more features in mobile caddy but also lots of alignment to a growing number of features uh, both in Salesforce and the, and the external environment that we mentioned. Um, so something that we've been working on um, ha has been our new help center. Um, that's now released in closed beta. If you are listening to the call and, and fancy early access, uh, I'll give some contact details at the end, uh, but please do. We're aligning that whole help center around the life cycle of the application. So in a lot of cases, much easier to surface the relevant documentation, but more importantly, also to orientate yourself, not just to the mobile caddy product, but to the life cycle stages of that uh, mobile application that may not be so obvious when you first start a project. Um, so this is not just around the mobile caddy product, uh, although the help center is heavily obviously biased towards the documentation for that, but also around orientation and concepts and so forth. So ongoing piece of work for us, um, but it's something, um, you know, having seen the early um, pilots and now the closed beta, very proud of, of of what we're achieving there. And of course, we would very much like any type of criticism back on that. Um, and then alongside that, um, we mentioned something earlier about um, a known behavior through the um, permission set creator, which is on roadmap. Uh, we'll use that as an example. Um, it's something that is... Um, as a specific, it's very minor in the sense of uh, getting over, but if it was an issue, and um, before it's been not as easy to understand if we've got any known issues or issues we're working on post uh, GA of items. Um, so we've brought a new clarity to the trust site now, instead of just uh, alerts and notifications, we now have a, a, a tracking section uh, on trust.mobilecaddy.net. And currently this supports uh, known issues for all open and closed, um, it also um, uh, uncovers the API support in a more graphical fashion so you can see exactly the running apps uh, API support that we can have for Salesforce with our latest components. So as Paul was mentioning earlier, uh, you know, the target API and the API we're testing against. Uh, and also um, 
opening up some more visibility from our internal trust and QA uh, team uh, around how we test for the critical updates um, uh, from Salesforce. So although they align to releases in terms of being available, um, the application of those or the, the ability to apply them is down to the uh, individual org. Um, so that gives us a bit of time, and that's the whole purpose of Salesforce doing this, a bit of time to test them. Now, that's our testing, so it would still be uh, you know, strongly advised for clients to um, do their own uh, applying of those critical updates and testing across their org, uh, uh, you know, wider than the mobile Kali application. But what it means is we're bringing visibility uh, to, to, to those. And in the coming months, we'll see the store policies and the other tracking items that uh, one that Frank mentioned there and so on and so forth. And that just helps not just uh, give the visibility, but the confidence and also to answer the questions uh, that are changing every day. You know, what do we support? What are we tested against? Uh, and for our perspective, uh, it gives us the visibility of all the work we do uh, in what is a heavy QA process, continual QA process and pre-release testing uh, system. So yes, as I say, close B to the Mother Cali Help Center. Please do give us a shout and I'll give you the contact details in a second. And um, yeah, in terms of the trust site, lots more visibility or at least a compacted place to find uh, all of these uh, updates. And they will be referenced out from the new Help Center as well. So yeah, a nice uh, point to end on uh, adjacent to the to, to, to the product updates. Uh, so I think with that, uh, I thank everyone who's uh, joined us on the call and everyone who's listening uh, post the recording. And of course, to Paul, Todd and Frank uh, for uh, all the good updates that we've had through. As I said, if you've got any ideas or requests for new features uh, or specifically to um, request access to the um, early release of the help center um, please ma mail us on info at mobilecaddy.net um, or alternatively give us a ping on any of the normal social channels uh, um, and you'll find us there so with that uh, thanks very much and hope to speak to you next month